June 1986. In Northern California, the state capital of Sacramento is experiencing a period of growth and prosperity. It was expanding. More people were coming to live here. Um, different neighborhoods were developing. I think anybody who moved here absolutely would love it and will want to live here. It's definitely a place that you can raise kids, raise a family, and retire. There are some areas of the city that even longtime residents try to avoid. One is Oak Park on Sacramento's southeast side, the city's oldest suburb. It didn't pay to go into Oak Park by yourself, because you never know what's going to happen. It was just a plain mean area. And they had lots of problems with um, drugs and street prostitution. There were all the crimes involving drinking and drugs, lots of fights. At the time, the drug fueling much of that violence is taking the city by storm. Rock cocaine, uh, or commonly known as crack, uh, that was something that was now starting to take its place in the uh, Sacramento drug area. And uh, we were finding lots of people using it, uh, being that it was extremely uh, addictive. I think Oak Park probably in the 1980s was at its highest peak as far as uh, drug usage. For many drug users in Oak Park, fueling their $400 a day habit is a full-time job. 22-year-old Yolanda Johnson is one of those people. But it wasn't always that way. I understand that she was a very, very good cosmetologist. She did hair. But once she got into the crack cocaine scene, she never returned. Her thing was to, you know, steal the, anything that didn't belong to her, to barter off, to sell off, to get her drug. Known in the neighborhood as Yo-Yo, Johnson works as a prostitute, cruising the local strip to finance her next high. It is a job with its own set of occupational hazards. She was just one of those uh, individuals that was working in a type of uh, a job that, uh, you know, you were very susceptible to being victimized in whatever manner. You know, either rape, uh, beatings, drug rip-offs. Sometimes working girls in the neighborhood simply disappear, and Yolanda knows a few who have been missing for several months. But Yolanda also knows from experience that women in this profession come and go, often without warning. The thing about when these people came up missing who were on drugs or prostitutes, they would leave home and be gone three or four months at a time and then they'd come back, stay around three or four months, then leave and come back. Another hazard of the job is the police. On June 9th, 1986, Yolanda is arrested for soliciting. She is back on the streets a few days later, and on June 15th, she gets into an argument with another prostitute, Pamela Suggs. And I think Pamela Suggs might have been one of the last persons who saw Yolanda Johnson alive. June 18th, 1986. At 8 o'clock in the morning, a truck pulls up in front of a vacant house in the Sacramento suburb of Oak Park. This person was going to finish up some last minute details because I believe the owner was coming in the next day to make sure the house was done. So he went into the house and he smelled a foul odor. He knew that it was something wrong because he had been in Vietnam before and he knew a bad smell, a deathly smell when he did, but he never really paid any attention to it. Figuring it's probably a dead animal, the workman goes outside to collect the carpeting he plans to install that morning. So he went back up to the house and that smell hit him in the face again. So this time he wants to check out the whole house. So he goes through all, all the rooms in the house. When he gets to the last room, he opens the door and walks in and then he sees a dead body in the closet. So he called police to report it and uh, homicide detectives responded out there. When Sacramento homicide detectives arrive at the address, they recognize it as a house frequented by drug addicts and prostitutes. At night, the house would be pretty much turned into a trick pad, a place where you would go, have, where you would go and do drugs. Inside a bedroom closet, police find the decomposing body of a woman, naked from the waist down. 
They also find drug paraphernalia used to smoke crack cocaine. There was nothing inside of the residence, so you really couldn't say that any furniture was thrown about or there was any fighting going on. But uh, it was evident that uh, there was some sexual activity uh, that had uh, taken place there. There was what appeared to be um, semen found on one of her legs. And uh, at that time, DNA was in its infancy as far as uh, being able to find out immediately um, who the DNA, DNA may be connected to. But to me, that was probably uh, the most uh, critical piece of evidence on the scene. In 1986, the science behind DNA is relatively new and still cumbersome. The sample must be sent to a federal crime lab where results are anything but immediate. Sometimes it would take two or three years. You know, it was, there was a backlog. The only other clues are three fingerprints, but they turn out to be those of the workman who discovered the body. The man, who identifies himself as 42-year-old Carl Patilla, tells police that he has been doing renovations on the house for about a month, but has not been there for several days. Carl is interviewed by media at the scene, but the story is far from front-page news. It wasn't one of those crimes that got a lot of public attention or outrage because they were prostitutes and drug addicts and they lived in a, a bad part of town. I mean, it wasn't a real concern. That same day, the coroner's office puts a name to the body. It is 22-year-old Yolanda Johnson, who disappeared three days earlier. The following month, however, another crime scene will be discovered in Oak Park. And this time, the incident won't seem quite so isolated. Cause of death has not been confirmed, but it is clear that police are dealing with a homicide. Detectives have already questioned Carl Patilla, the 42-year-old handyman who discovered the body at the vacant house where he was doing renovations. There is little he can tell them beyond what he found that morning. Although he lives and works in the Oak Park area, he has never seen the victim before and has not been at the house for several days. However, later that day, a routine fingerprint check makes it clear that while he is a handyman and has been doing renovation work in and around Oak Park for more than two years, Carl Patilla is not who he says he is. He was using his brother's name, so he wasn't really Carl Patilla. He was some individual, another individual. So they checked him out. The police checked him out. His real name is Morris Solomon Jr., and police discover that he has a criminal record dating back to 1969. Convicted of sexual assault in 1971, he is classified as a mentally disordered sex offender and sent to a facility for two years of treatment. Following his release, Solomon is acquitted in the 1974 murder of a California masseuse after a key witness fails to show up for the trial. In 1977, he is sentenced to two years to life in San Quentin for the sexual assault and rape of a prostitute. Since his parole in 1980, there have been no further convictions. On the evening of June 18th, 1986, detectives bring Solomon back in for questioning. The handyman admits that he lied about his identity because he has several outstanding warrants and was afraid he would be arrested. Most are for traffic misdemeanors, but one is for soliciting prostitution. When confronted with a photograph of the victim, Solomon now acknowledges that he knows her to be local prostitute Yolanda Yo-Yo Johnson. He admits to using her services six months earlier, and that at the time, she ripped him off for $20. He denies any further sexual contact with her and is adamant that he has not seen her for more than a week. Through it all, Solomon is completely cooperative, admitting that he made a mistake trying to hide his identity and eager to help in any way he can. He just seemed like a very average person. Um, and when you talk to him, you know, he, he was a very polite person. And so when you saw him, you just took it as, well, he just maybe did stumble upon the body and found him, you know, because he isn't acting suspicious in any way. 
Although his past makes Solomon a prime suspect, there is no hard evidence that ties him to Yolanda Johnson's death. There is also the question of why he would contact police in the first place if he is responsible. Without more evidence, the DA's office is unwilling to prosecute. And since the handyman's existing warrants are for misdemeanors only, Sacramento police decide to let him go. Although they are unable to detain him, they do intend to find out more about Morris Solomon Jr. In Oak Park, they discover a man well-liked in the community. Morris could uh, repair anything. And that's why he was so successful finding work. Because people were renovating houses. He was reliable, as some of the people had told us. Uh, and they could count on him. For this reason, his employers often allow Solomon to live in the houses that he renovates, moving from place to place as he moves from job to job. Detectives also talk to those who have worked with Solomon since his arrival in Oak Park, but in a very different capacity. Prostitutes in the neighborhood who knew Yolanda Johnson also know Morris Solomon very well. They thought he was basically a generous person. He would even date women. And if he didn't have the money, you know, they didn't have sex with him on credit. The next couple of days when he got that money, Morris went there to pay those money. So yeah, he definitely had a, he's had a good heart. By July 15th, almost a month after the discovery of Yolanda Johnson's body, Sacramento detectives are no closer to solving her murder. There is every indication that Morris Solomon Jr. had nothing to do with her death, and there are no further suspects. That same day, 24-year-old Angela Polidore is released from police custody after spending four days in jail on prostitution charges. Angela Polidore lived in Oak Park. She was absolutely a knockout, drop-dead gorgeous female. She is one person who was known in the neighborhood who would chase crack cocaine 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 365 days a year. That was her thing. Whatever she could do to get that drug, she would do. And that's including having sex, selling the body. In the early morning hours of July 16th, 1986, Angela Polidore finds someone who is willing to provide her with the drug she craves. She brings him to the home of a friend, Janice Scott. This particular person used to let her bring Johns over to her house to have sex in the laundry room or something like that. But her uh, friend was like, look, hey, it's too late. <laughs> you gotta go. So, well, Angela said, well, can I sit here and smoke this vial of uh, crack cocaine? She said, yes, hurry up, make it quick. So they went in the bathroom to smoke this crack cocaine. And that was the last time they saw her. But they had mentioned that they thought she had left in a pickup truck. July 20th, 1986. On Sacramento Boulevard in the suburb of Oak Park, a man plays catch with his son. Although the condemned house next door has undergone some renovations, the man recently boarded it up to prevent its use as a neighborhood trick pad. But when his son throws the ball too far, it disappears inside the house. The dad goes to check out the house, and he sees that the back door is jarred open after he had nailed it shut. He also smells something funny. The man calls the police, and Detective Sergeant John Cabrera arrives at the scene. It was mid-afternoon, hot July day. Before I got to the door, I could already smell what I had smelled many times before, uh, that stench, that stench of death. Went down into the basement area and looked around and then um, found the victim uh, had been dragged on the floor from the east end of the basement all the way to the west end. And then some items were placed on top of her in order to try to conceal her body. The female victim lies in a fetal position, her wrists and ankles bound with an electrical cord. After looking at the scene, looking at the items that I found there, which included uh, some type of uh, metal pads that uh, commonly used in the smoking of rock cocaine, 
uh, and given the state of how we found the victim, uh, it was kind of obvious to me that uh, there was probably some uh, drug use going on, uh, that there was some kind of a sexual uh, activity going on. We knew that the house was under renovation, but we also knew that it was in an area of um, high drug use. That's what uh, some of the people told us that we had canvassed uh, in the neighborhood, and that was, you know, people were using it, people were coming and going. So uh, we really couldn't clearly establish if anyone had seen her or, or uh, the perpetrator or anything to lead them to believe that something had occurred. It took them a while, at least a couple of weeks, to identify the body, but they were able to identify that it was Angela Polidori. We had found that uh, she was reported missing that month. And um, her background showed that she'd had uh, a history of prostitution, drug use. As far as the media is concerned, it is just another tragic end to an already tragic life. Another back page story, as far as anybody could tell. With no witnesses and no confirmed cause of death, police are once again left with little to go on. Remembering a similar case from the month before, police search for connections between the two deaths. Given the um, circumstances on Angela's case, where this is a house that was uh, currently being renovated, uh, nobody was living there, uh, the type of activity as far as narcotic activity, maybe some uh, sexual activity going on, that was what we could connect to Yolanda Johnson's case. But at that point, that is really all we really had. With the results of the DNA test still pending and no hard evidence to connect anyone to the crimes, police can only continue the search for the killer's identity before he kills again. As a department, we wanted to make sure uh, that we had as much as we could to prove our case. So. Yeah, it was very much on our minds. Unfortunately for the police and for some of the working girls of Oak Park, time is already running out. March 1987. It has been eight months since the decomposed, partially nude bodies of two prostitutes were discovered in Oak Park, a low-income suburb of Sacramento, California. Homicide investigators have suspicions that the two murders are connected. They know that both women were heavily into crack cocaine and that both were found in deserted houses where prostitutes took clients to have sex. They also know that Angela Polidori was last seen driving off with an unidentified man the night she disappeared. With little else to go on, police still search for leads that tie Yolanda Johnson and Angela Polidori to a single killer. As head of the department's missing persons branch, Detective John Cabrera has been sifting through files opened over the past year, looking for a link to other prostitutes who have disappeared. It's not real easy to determine if you have a prostitute that's a missing person uh, if in fact they're the victim of a crime. You know that disappearance could be based on the fact that they were arrested in another county or jurisdiction or even another state. So it takes a while to try to track them down. Several cases, however, share definite similarities. Cabrera knows one of them firsthand. She is 24-year-old Linda Vitella, a drug addict and known prostitute. John Cabrera would tell me <laughs> He would, when he was working vice, he would run up on Linda Vitello working 16th Street, working a stroll. Hey, what are you doing here? Get out of here. I know what you're doing. And she would leave and disappear. Missing for more than a year, she was last seen in February 1986. Linda was supposed to go over to her mom's house to get her hair done. Linda didn't show. She did not show. Someone who was acquainted with Linda said they saw her and another individual Linda jumps in the car with this male companion that she was with, and they took off. They never saw Linda. The most recent disappearance on Cabrera's list occurred just one month earlier, in February 1987. The mother of two children, 26-year-old Cherie Washington, was a woman whose life was spiraling out of control. 
She was absolutely a beautiful, gorgeous woman. She was a singer. <laughs> she was a dancer. They said we should go to the parties. And she would be the best dancer and singer out the whole set. As beautiful as she was, somehow she fell into drugs. And when she got into drugs, she did do a little prostitution. February 6th, 1987. At 9 p.m., after a night spent doing drugs at her sister's house, Cherie heads to a local liquor store. An hour went by. Two hours went by. And she's not back. So she, the sister and the best friend, they go out looking for Cherie. She just kind of like, poof. Just disappeared in the thin smoke. She had been reported missing. She was one of a group of, I believe, eight that we were taking a look at at the time. All similar. All a history of uh, narcotics use. All a history of one time or another some prostitution. So we were connecting uh, with that possibility that and somehow they were connected to our perpetrator. March 19th, 1987. At a repossessed home in Oak Park, workmen are preparing to lay drainage pipe when they come across a piece of plywood buried in the backyard. So they dug up around it and then they noticed that it was a black trash bag sticking out as well. So one guy said, well, I have this knife. I'll just cut it open and we'll see what it is. And he cut the bag open and a foot pops out. A human foot pops out. Homicide detectives find the decomposed body of a woman tied in the fetal position by electrical cords. Word of another body in Oak Park reaches the local media. I don't think anybody gave a second thought to the first one, or two, or even three. But then when it became kind of a, you know, a, a pattern, that was the deal right there that you figure, well, maybe there's, you know, a little bit more to this that's going on. As with a previous body, the level of decomposition makes the body difficult to identify. The layers of tissue become so decomposed that you can't take fingerprints. The tissue on the fingertips, the skin sloughs off. Two tattoos on the victim's shoulders are the only definitive clues. But police cannot match them with their list of missing persons. However, media reports about the body prompt one family to contact police and ultimately give the unidentified victim a name. 18-year-old high school dropout turned prostitute, Maria Apodaca. I believe Maria was biracial, black and Latina, young, very attractive. Another person who was arrested, busted for drugs, crack cocaine in particular. There were people who wanted to help her, you know, clean up her act, you know, get her into rehab and stuff like that. She wanted to beat the drug, but she never could. She never could. Although Maria has been missing for almost six months, her family and friends never report her disappearance. I think there is some reluctance, and I think that reluctance is born out of the knowledge that that particular person maybe was involved in prostitution or high narcotics use and that simply the police weren't going to do anything. With the identification of Maria Apodaca, investigators turned their attention to the address where her body was found. One witness who lived in the house until November 1986 tells detectives that Maria was a frequent visitor. In fact, a number of women involved in prostitution came to the residence between April and November 86, not only to have sex, but to get high on rock cocaine. Each time, they were in the company of the same person, Morris Solomon Jr. Further investigation brings another important link to the surface. All three locations where bodies have been found are homes once lived in or renovated by Morris Solomon. It is the break that Sacramento police have been searching for. Not only are the three crime scenes very similar, but their new information now ties Morris Solomon to all three victims and each of the crime scenes. We could see that there was a commonality on how they were victimized and how they were found, how they were left. It became evident that, that maybe one person was responsible for these deaths. 
you know, of these victims. Police are more certain than ever that one person is Morris Solomon Jr. And although it may already be too late, they have to stop him before he can kill again. Since they still lack the hard evidence needed to make an arrest, Sacramento police send a special surveillance team to keep an eye on the Oak Park handyman. It was generally to keep a tab on what his daily activity was, or if in fact he was going to do anything that uh, might immediately connect him um, to some of these other deaths, or a little bit something a little bit more viable uh, at the time. In the meantime, detectives continue to search for evidence that links Solomon not only to the three murders, but to unsolved missing persons cases involving prostitutes and known drug users. Uh, what we know as a commonality, linking the victims, I think one of them to be uh, narcotics use, prostitution, uh, being out in the street, and uh, predominantly they all were hanging in Oak Park. And so we could see this clear pattern. So what we did was uh, we used the missing persons cases and we were able to publish the people that we were looking for as that there was a possibility that maybe they were connected to some of these cases or maybe their disappearance was connected in some way to these cases that we were having. What detectives don't want to do is tip their hand by giving too much information to the media. Nobody was really sure that at the time, I would, they, they knew there were a lot of a lot of women being murdered, but you know, I, I don't think at the time anybody figured, you know, or anybody knew exactly, except for the police, you know, what was going on. There were connections made, but once again, you know, the police, the Sacramento Police Department, didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to blow their investigation. While news of another murder barely creates a stir in and around Oak Park, families of the three victims and those of the women still missing are eager to see the case solved. We went and talked with families, trying to get information as to other people who might be able to help us, who they were maybe hanging around. And then we started to go even deeper into friends or friends of friends to try to get more information as to the possibility of having witnesses that might have seen the victim with, you know, the perpetrator. In some of the cases, we were very successful. Police are now able to connect Morris Solomon to more than just the locations where Yolanda Johnson and Angela Polidori were found. They also have the address where Maria Apodaca was buried, the same place Solomon was living in when she disappeared in October 1986. To prove that Solomon is responsible for all three murders, detectives follow leads that take them to almost every corner of the Sacramento suburb. They came up with something like nearly 20 residents that, that this person was connected with. And most of these houses was in the Oak Park area. We started looking into all of the different places that he had lived, all the different places that he had worked, uh, information that we were receiving that uh, some of these people missing were last seen with Moore Solomon. Uh, we started to connect the dots. On April 20th, 1987, those dots lead police to an address where Solomon resided from January until late March. 1986. This house uh, was known to be a crack house, a place where people went to do drugs. Uh, there were people in and out of this house, always. Drug dealers, drug users, prostitutes. Detectives are there to check out a derelict car left behind by Solomon when he moved out. In the backyard, they notice an unusual depression in the ground next to the house. They borrow a shovel from a neighbor and begin to dig. They went in the backyard. They took a couple shovelful of dirt from this shallow grave and a face emerged. A, a skeletized face emerged from the ground. Whoa, so they bounced back. Oh, we have another dead body here. So they called in an excavation team. They come and they dig the body out. The condition of the body wasn't ideal. 
and the dirt had to be removed very, very carefully, especially around the face and mouth, because we were very certain that this was going to require a dental identification. And what we didn't want to do was damage the body any further with shovels or trowels or anything like that. As the body is uncovered, investigators can see that it is female and that there are similarities to the three previous victims. She was bound from the, uh, her wrist, this time in the front, and from her legs, half nude from the waist down. The cause of death still was not, you know, openly clear, uh, but we still could tell it was a foul play type of death. By the following day, the coroner's office is able to identify the victim as 26-year-old Shuri Washington, missing since February. Once again, police keep the suspect's identity under wraps. After a month of surveillance, Solomon has done nothing to connect himself to the crimes. And although he is aware of the discovery of more bodies, he has made no attempt to leave town. Meanwhile, the investigation brings homicide detectives to another Oak Park address where Morris Solomon was living when the body of Yolanda Johnson was discovered. In the backyard, they find the shallow graves of two more victims, wrapped in bedding and tied in bundles. Both bodies are so decomposed that it is clear they were buried months before Yolanda Johnson was killed in June 1986. One of them is on John Cabrera's missing persons list, 24-year-old prostitute Linda Vitella, who has been missing for more than a year. With the discovery of more bodies at the addresses directly tied to their suspect, the district attorney's office is now ready to issue a warrant. Later that evening, at 8.05 p.m., police arrive at another Oak Park address, not to search for a body, but to arrest the man who lives there. Morris Solomon Jr. gives up without a struggle, maintaining the same quiet demeanor he presented to police when he first reported the discovery of Yolanda Johnson's body almost a year earlier. I think what Morris was trying to do was the double psychology. And that is, why would I report a body in a house that I was working on if I was the one who had killed her? That proved to be his uh, fatal uh, move. From a homicide detective's point of view, if you look at the evidence, the first person that we look at is that person that made the phone call. And that was more Solomon. Although there are no witnesses and no physical evidence to connect Solomon to any of the crimes, he is charged with six counts of murder. I believe there was enough circumstantial evidence piling up against him where they could issue a warrant for but they never found anything on him in his possession, anything like that. I think people were probably shocked that one person was doing all this. To me, it just didn't, didn't seem like a serial deal. You know, until we found out from the police that that's what was suspected. You know, I said, is he the guy that supposedly, you know, killed all the women? And they said, yeah, that's him. And boy, what a mousy looking little dude. You know, that uh, just looked like you know, he wouldn't be capable of something like that. There was just nothing that would, in my opinion, keep prostitutes away from him. Uh, I think they looked at him in the same way as, here's a guy who's harmless, you know, who's got money. Uh, let's go smoke some rock and we'll have some sex too and I'm going to make money because this guy isn't capable of doing anything. Just take a look at him. And, uh, of course, he used it to his advantage. You know, it would be like... You know, come with me, said the spider to the fly. Morris Solomon denies having anything to do with the killings. It might take me two, three years of sitting in your county jail, but uh, I know in my heart and my mind I have to kill nobody. I mean, I'm not no angel. I did a lot of wrong things in my life, but to kill a person, no. There are those who can verify this dark underside of Solomon's personality, women who narrowly escaped his web. Several of them contact authorities after his arrest. One important piece of the puzzle finally falls into place after the arrest. The semen sample taken from Yolanda Johnson's thigh turns out to be consistent with a sample of Solomon's blood. DNA technology then was, was new as far as the courts were concerned.
much, but it was narrowed down fairly closely that it was Maura Solomon that was the person that had sex with her shortly before she died. Despite the media attention, the Solomon case raises only a few eyebrows outside the Oak Park suburb, even after a seventh body is found a week after the handyman's arrest. I think that the residents just uh, believe that these were people that were uh, in a, a business that uh, was volatile as far as uh, death or injury or being victimized and uh, looked at it in some sense that way that was old park morris solomon jr faces seven counts of murder in the first degree the trial that follows will tell the tale of a double-edged personality harmless and unassuming on the outside but diabolical and deadly within may 1991 in a courtroom in sacramento california the trial of morris solomon jr gets underway the handyman is charged with the first degree murders of seven women in the suburb of oak park during 1986 and 1987. at first glance the defendant seems incapable of such horrendous crimes even the police admit that during their investigation solomon was always cooperative and eager to help but you know this type of behavior is not uncommon or unusual when you're talking about a serial killer very likable very manipulative uh, very sociable all those skills which got him through the front door but the violence and uh, the horrendous acts that he committed on the uh, victims it was just unbelievable uh, this guy was just a killing machine although the murders have been covered extensively only a dozen spectators show up for the opening statements the defense presents solomon as a victim himself painting a picture of a life shaped by violence at an early age morris was born in albany georgia in 1944 deep south state he was basically raised by his grandmother and I, his grandmother beat the hell out of him him and his brother and his cousin she would tie him up with the electrical cords tie him to his bed and this went on for years and years and years and i think it's more than a a, a coincidence that many of the ladies when they were found had electrical cords um, wrapped around them a tour of duty in Vietnam in the mid-60s affords Solomon his first experience with prostitution, a way to relieve the stress of combat. To have sex with the Asian women in Vietnam. But there was another side to that. They were, the GIs were having sex sometimes with the enemy and did not know it. Many times, prostitutes were used by the enemy to inflict pain and suffering on the soldiers so GIs knew that they could also be um, dangerous and Morris picked up on that matter of fact one of Morris Solomon's friends was killed by a prostitute right there in front of him so I think in the process it was half sex with the bound gag and rape I think that carried on back in the United States when he came back in 1966. I know a lot of the fellows who came back, there were many, and their personalities were really changed. The prosecution introduces 15,000 court documents and over 600 exhibits that depict Solomon as a cold-blooded killer, whose friendly, unassuming manner, along with the promise of drugs and money, endeared him to local prostitutes needing to score. He seemed to prey on vulnerable people, you know, people that did have a history of being on the outskirts of society, drug addicts, prostitutes. Um, you know, I think it was availability. He lived in the neighborhood. He knew a lot of these people. I, I think they were available to him, basically, and trusted him. The evidence, however, is all circumstantial, since no one actually saw Solomon kill any of the victims. There was no hard evidence to really connect him to. The pathologists, the, the coroners, they could not determine a cause of death. 
At the same time, there are witnesses who can testify that they saw the victims in Solomon's company. Well, I think the main common thread that the prosecutor had was the fact that Morris Solomon had had contact with all of these ladies and that Morris Solomon generally had some connection to the location where each and every one of them were, were found. In addition to this, surviving victims of Solomon's attacks testify against him. A former prostitute tells the court that Solomon tied her up with electrical cords in August 1986 and raped her repeatedly until her boyfriend's return scared him off. Since she was on probation, she had not reported the attack at the time. Another woman tells a story of being attacked by a man who tries to drag her into his truck at knife point. She escaped, but did not report the incident immediately. In court, she identifies the man as Morris Solomon Jr. On August 29th, 1991, after 10 days of deliberation, the jury returns with its verdict. Guilty on six of the seven counts of murder. Four of them were first degree murders, two of them were second degree murders. And plus he was convicted of five other sexual offenses from women who survived his attacks. The sentence is death by lethal injection. And on September 23rd, 1992, Morris Solomon Jr. is transferred to San Quentin State Prison where he awaits execution as the 342nd inmate to be sent to death row. I just don't think there was uh, anything left for the jury to do. Given the fact that he was convicted of six murders. To say that Morris would have killed a certain amount of people and stopped would be wrong. Morris would have continued to kill and kill and kill until he was stopped. To this day, Morris Solomon Jr. denies being involved in any of the killings. He remains on death row and as yet does not have an execution date. He knows he's not going anywhere. That's his life. And quite honestly, I do not believe that they're going to get a chance to inject that needle in his arm. I think he'll die in there of natural causes. I believe he think he'll die in there of natural causes. Solomon leaves behind families devastated by the loss of their loved ones, not only the seven known victims, but also those whose fates will forever remain a mystery. More Solomon, to me, has to be one of the uh, top serial killers, simply because, you know, we do know how many he killed and that he was convicted of here, but we really don't know how many he's killed over his lifetime. We know where it ended. But where did it start? And we still have people missing to this day that we know are and somehow connected to Morris. It was just such a surprise to see what a mousy little guy he was. <laughs> to, and that, uh, to think that he was actually capable, you know, of taking that many lives and just getting away with it, you know, for that long. So it's, uh, but that's it. Glad they got him.